today we have something for everyone. We have, uh, uh, for those who have not designed for CFI yet or have not even heard about the technology, we have uh, sort of a simple tutorial that takes us through the basic concepts of the CFI signaling and some of the advantages that it brings. Um, and then for others who have designed, you know, combo files already like CK and Ashraf and others, uh, we, would, we will give you a preview into what comes next on CFI 1.2 and some of the uh, quite innovative features in that protocol that would enable very advanced implementations. So if uh, you've never seen CFI before, the one thing I would uh, uh, highlight is the concept of bandwidth efficiency. The CFI interface was really invented to enable high bandwidth transmissions on restricted channels. So if you have a PCB trace that's bandwidth limited and you want to transfer a lot of data through it, then CFI gives you that advantage because of uh, the multi-bit uh, nature of it. So in one statement, for every one clock period in your digital transmission, instead of sending just one bit in that period of information, you're sending 2.285 bits of information, of use, useful messaging that gets across the line. And that happens through what is called three-phase encoding, or generally multi-phase encoding. So this is an area of research that um, has taken a few years in, in research labs, and uh, the concept of three phase is really what's implemented in the MIPI Alliance uh, CFI specification. So one unit interval gives you 2.285 bits of data, and we'll go through the, you know, what enables that. And so what enables it is uh, what I describe here in this slide. And again, I tend to create you know, visual images of the specification. I'm not going to go and uh, give you printouts of the specification. I want to give you memorable descriptions of the concepts of the specification. And so one way I see C5 is really an array of wires working together to create a lane. And this is nothing but a generalization of what we've done over the last 50 years in digital communications. So if you look at single-ended signals in sing single-ended digital systems, you had one wire and you wanted to encode bits, a bit value of zero was encoded with a low voltage level, typically zero, for example, in CMOS. And a bit value of one was encoded with a high voltage level, 3.3 volt, 1.8 volt, 1.2 volt, it doesn't matter, but it's a voltage encoding. And then differential came along and said, okay, we'll do two wires. We'll say a positive wire and a negative wire. They will both work in concert to send one bit. So to send a bit zero, one wire goes high, the other goes low. To send a bit one, they reverse function. And so three-phase encoding or multi-phase encoding did the same idea but generalized it and, and asked the question, what if we could do three wires working together in concert to create a bit transmission? And so in C5, the, you know, the number of wires chosen was three, and the three wires work together just like PNN and differential. They're now called ABC typically and they work together to create one lane and one set of transmissions. And then on the receiver side, what CFI has done is it had recognized that the ecosystem, the entire you know, industry works on binary receivers. And some of the inventive work that George Wiley has done at Qualcomm is to discover that it's possible to actually maintain the binary receivers and just connect them in a certain way so that we could get the benefits of multi-phase encoding while at the same time being entirely binary on the receiver side. And so that's one lane of CFI. And when we talk about you know, lanes or trios, if you have a two trio system like uh, CK described uh, in the previous slide, well then you have two sets of three wires working together to create effectively two lanes. So technically now a bit in, into how these things work and how, how do we maintain specifically the binary um, function on the receivers. Uh, there are mapping uh, and encoding technologies that are described in the specifications, but I always like to boil them down into a couple of concepts, right? And the first concept is uh, what I call, you know, the multi-level signaling on the transmitter and how it, it guarantees that there's absolutely no uh, d um, contention on, on binary receivers. So if we look at wire A with the blue waveform and uh, wire B with the red waveform on the left, uh, the first clock period we're showing here, the uh, wire A is high and, and wire B is at the mid-level. 
So if we pass over to the right and see the, the difference between A and B, uh, one voltage is always higher than the other. So that first clock period, the AB amplifier in the receiver is seeing a logic one. And the important thing is that it's binary. We go to the next clock period, something interesting happens. Wire A goes from a high level to a mid-level, which is not conventional digital signaling. Uh, but the good news is that B follows it. So B also goes to a low level. And so for the difference between A and B is still a positive finite number. It's not zero. And so a binary receiver detects that as one. Right? And so we can look at this waveform and, and look at these transitions that we're saying, displaying here on the slide. And we'll see, even though each individual wire on its own looks somewhat unconventional, the receiver is seeing 11101, which is just a differential uh, binary receiver. So that's one rule of thumb for C5 and that what makes it so robust for transmissions. The other one is the concept of uh, clock recovery. So C5 uh, signaling systems do not need a separate clock plane, like a forwarded clock, for example, in other standards. And the reason is that the mapping function basically guarantees that there's always symbol transitions at the receiver. This is something that's not necessarily foreign in any digital transmission system. If we look at PCI Express or USB 3 or other embedded clock uh, implementations, they create mapping functions or encoding functions rather that guarantee a certain transition density in the receiver. And uh, typically that's 50% to allow PLLs to recover uh, data. C5 does something similar, but because of just the nature of the, um, of the mapping function in C5, it actually guarantees the equivalent of 100% transition density. So your CDR now is ensured that every period in its uh, clock domain will have at least one transition. The example we're showing here is an extreme example, but it's real that you see it on C5 signals all the time, where you could have a wire stay stationary for a long time, like wire B in this uh, slide. And that's typically a problem for embedded system applications like PCI Express. It's not a problem here because the concert of A, B, and C is always transitioning. And so at least one of the amplifiers on the receiver will always have a clock on, uh, uh, sorry, an edge on every uh, clock period. So basically, again, you know, two slides describing the fundamentals of C5. And if I, you know, look at it, it's really, you know, multi-level signaling on a group of three wires together on the transmitter side, differential receivers uh, that uh, guarantee immunity to noise and, and common, common mode effects, and then some mapping technologies that may appear non-deterministic or appear unnatural to see maybe on an oscilloscope, but that also, you know, guarantee, uh, you know, 100% transition density for the clock recovery system. So we'll you know, transition to a bit more you know, advanced topics here and, and describe the encoding and mapping functions uh, in some more detail. We'll describe it from, again, an, you know, an intuitive point of view and just highlight certain aspects of the specification um, documents from the MIPI Alliance. So to do that, we'll start with some, some definitions. And I think we've already talked about wire states and number of, uh, number of levels uh, in the previous uh, presentation. Uh, but on the left side of the slide, we uh, see the groups of wires. And um, because of some of the rules of not creating equal value wires, uh, or voltages on the wires, uh, you end up with really six different combinations of uh, what is called wire states. So wire state is just the value, the, you know, the number of uh, combinations on the three wires together. So uh, you go from, a, from an actual wire voltage to wire states, which is the combination of the three wires. And uh, now I'll ask you to transition to the right side of the slide and, and look at uh, what happens with uh, the transitions. So a number six here, for example, is just nothing but a representation of the three wires above. So AB, BC, and CA are one, one, zero. So that's a three-bit representation of the number six. So for now, it's very convenient to just select the number six and say that combination of wires has a number associated with it, that's six. However, what's different in C5 is that that, that number is actually meaningless. The trans signal transmissions only happen when we uh, transition from one number to the next. So the next number here is five because the voltage levels are one, zero, one, and so that's five. 
And it's only when we move from six to five that we are transmitting data. And uh, as was mentioned before, data transmissions are called symbol transmissions, and that's simply because of just the number of bits that are created per, uh, per, transmission, uh, uh, per transmission cycle. And so uh, in a more tabular form, and something that's probably closer to the specification, uh, this is just a listing of the possible combinations of wires. There are six combinations of them that are shown here. And for convenience, uh, in the specification, these are given na um, names with polarities, you know, so alphabetical characters with polarities. So a wire state uh, with A being high, B being low, and C being mid uh, is called a plus X wire state. And then there's a minus X plus Y minus Y and, and so on. And that's just a convenient representation that we will help us create transmissions as we'll see next. So uh, with the wire states, I you know, give the title that, you know, that, as I mentioned before, transmissions happen with symbols and they really happen with transitions from one wire state to the next. And uh, this table on the left side of the slide is really just a simple uh, lookup table that uh, defines how transmissions are made. Uh, and uh, instead of actually describing the table, I'll take an example in, on the right-hand side here. So the yellow box is the actual data that we want to transmit. You know? So it's a symbol of value 1. This is what we want to transmit. It's not the plus x and it's not the minus z. It's the number 1. We happen to be at the plus x location, at the plus x state right now, and we want to transmit a 1. So the table just tells us that for transmitting a 1, which is the second row on the table, the flip uh, function is zero. And if we look down at the, uh, at the dictionary at the bottom, flip has no action, so we ignore that. The rotate function is zero. So in the rotate table, we see that zero means decrement the letter. So we were at x, decrementing the letter takes us to z on the other side. And then finally, the polarity value is saying is one, and the Definition for one is to toggle sign. So we said we were at plus x. We knew we had to go to z. And then the last uh, column in the table told us, well, now you're at z, change the polarity to minus z. So to transmit a one, when you were at plus x, you had to go to minus z. We take another example. Now we want to transmit a three. If you just follow the rules, you'll see from minus z, we're at minus z now. We want to transmit a three. We go back to plus x. So you could see the action in going from plus x to minus z and then minus z back to plus x, we're sending completely different data. So the key message here is that the data being transmitted are the transitions between the states. So we went from wire states, then we described that wire states are really meaningless in their own way, in their own, on their own, and they only uh, help us define symbol transmissions, which are transitions between wire states. We introduced the concept of uh, symbols and uh, defined that there are you know, multiple symbols for each tra state transition that was well described in the uh, previous presentation. Now we go on and, and talk about converting these symbols into digital systems, or digital numbers, rather. And that's because our digital logic in our chips, in, in our you know, ASICs, if it's a camera, or on the display driver ICs, if it's a display application, are just used to byte-oriented uh, calculations or word-oriented cal calculations in general. So symbols are good in the, in the analog domain. It's almost like RF, where we create some kind of constellation with simple transmissions in it. But fundamentally, once the data gets inside the chip, it needs to, to get converted back into 16-bit words or 8-bit words. Uh, CFI selected 16 bits because it's just that efficient. And so the table that's shown here is a simple, simple math, really, that describes how if I take a number of symbols and each one represents 2.28 bits, I can just increase, increment the number of symbols until I get a meaningful word boundary for our computer systems. So we could have chosen 8-bit word boundary, but that would not have been very efficient uh, given what CFI really can give us. So you extend it to 16, and you're approaching the theoretical maximum for the technology. So it's simple math. 2 to the 16 is 65,000. Let's find the minimum number of symbol sequences we need to assemble together to represent that uh, number. And so we end up with seven symbol sequences. So from here on, we'll talk about words, 16-bit words, really. 
that are transmitted in groups of seven symbols. So uh, the uh, 5 to the 7 symbols is greater than 2 to the 16, so we're happy. And once we do that, it's a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping between them. So now I want to step back actually before getting into some of the more advanced topics and talk about the global packet transmissions in C5 and compare them to D5. So I'll start with D5. It's a more, um, uh, it's a more mature standard and it's definitely in impl implementation with most of the adopters. So a, C a D5 transmission starts with an HS entry sequence from LTE. So 110100, it's known. Uh, then you enter into some preparation period and then you get into a... a HS0, where the you know, LP driver disables itself, the high-speed driver starts to uh, activate itself. And then before you start a packet transmission, you uh, announce to the receiver that you know, your start of packet is about to happen. And that happens with what is called SOT in, in DeFi. And so CFI uh, adopted the same LP signaling, exactly. You just have to remember that there's three wires, but they follow the same rules as DeFi. And then when it comes to preparation and high-speed transmissions, uh, it's a similar architecture. DeFi used to send a sequence of symbols that haven't, happen to be the value zero. CFI sends a sequence of symbols that happen to be the value three. So a sequence of three symbols is really announcing to the receiver that I've entered high speed. Then a packet transmission is delineated with a start of transmission marker. In C5, that's called sync, sync word. And then, of course, the payload data are grouped in sequences of seven symbols to represent six bits, 16 bits, rather. And so you could see even the, the bandwidth efficiency of C5 already is very apparent here. If we took a one-to-one -one representation between you know, the global timings, by the time we've reached the first byte in D5, we've transmitted, uh, you know, in less time, actually, we've transmitted 16 bits, two bytes already. Um, in that uh, same time, and that's really the big advantage for, for CFI. There are tools like uh, CK mentioned in the previous presentation. So, in, in a tool, from a tool perspective, we look like CAD, you know, CAD tools. You'll, you'll, you'll ha you, you're able to see the three phase signals um, in the time domain. These are generally not very meaningful because it's, they're always toggling and they always follow the, uh, the mapping and encoding state machine. But uh, if you remember that what we're interested in are the symbol transmissions uh, in the second to last row there, then you're able to quickly see what uh, goes on in the line. Okay, so we're done with an introduction to C5. I want to now talk about uh, some of the more advanced features that are coming in uh, C5 1.1, or oh, sorry, already in C5 1.2, but even in, in future C5 versions. And a lot of these rely on what I call the, you know, the magical unmapped words. These are unmapped words that I'll show examples of how they're used and how uh, they turn that protocol into really a very powerful tool for, uh, for creating various kinds of messaging uh, techniques. So we showed this slide before and we said, okay, we'll add the number of symbols, uh, sequences together to create two to the 16 uh, combinations of uh, integers. What that gave us is really uh, a space of completely unused seven symbol sequences. These are unmapped, which means they will never appear in any packet transmission that you ever create, right? Uh, they're, but they're there, they exist. And if uh, we were looking closely at the global packet transmission, I mentioned the sync word as the start of transmission marker. Well, that happens to be an unmapped word. It will never appear in a packet transmission. So it makes it ideal for actually telling receivers, hey, I'm about to start data. It's, it's, there's no, no chance whatsoever for it to be confused with, with uh, real data, unlike in a conventional binary uh, technology. So I want to look at these unmapped words and, and see what they really do. So our digital ASIC designers actually love uh, these unmapped words. They, it, it's very easy to delimit packets or bursts even. So, this uh, slide here talks about an LP to HS entry and an HS to LP exit. And uh, in D5, for example, you had trail and you had SOT, but there's always confusion. When is, where, you know, where's, where did my packet end and wh when I, where, where, where did my EOT start, right? And because it's all binary and there's no distinction. C5's unmapped words allow you to actually delimit this very, very easily. So sync will never appear in your data and it's used as the start of transmission. 
this sequence of seven fours also will never appear in your data and it can easily be used to signify end of transmission. So, so from a logic or a digital point of view, it's very easy now to create, uh, uh, to delimit uh, bursts. Another area where these unmapped words are used is actually within HS bursts. And that might seem contradictory at first sight, but uh, I'll take you through uh, what I mean by, by these uh, as we go and what, this, what the spirit of the specification uh, really meant with these. So on this slide, I'm showing a real packet transmission based on C5. And you could see the, the structures we talked about before, you know, the sync word at the far left. And then once the sync word starts, every seven symbols are combined into a 16-bit integer. So this last row is a 16-bit integer representing every seven symbols. So this is real data. And then it happens that, OK, well, somewhere here, I'm starting to see uh, what's labeled on this slide is none. It's no data, right? But there's physically on the line, there's seven symbols that are being transmitted, but they don't represent anything. And they appear in an almost periodic manner in this particular burst. Well, what this burst is doing is actually resynchronizing the header. So uh, if you, you know, C5 deploys protocols like CSI or DSI, which are packet-based, the header structures in them are very important to allow for error uh, you know, correction or for recovery from errors. And um, without getting into the history of these packet constructions, uh, some packets, in this case, I think a CSI2 packet, uh, will insert these unmapped words in the header just to protect against uh, false errors or, or bit errors in the, in the header. The uh, next example where uh, unmapped words will be very effective is in alternate low power mode. So there are applications beyond mobile where maybe we're not so much interested in uh, power optimization. And so alternate low power mode is being proposed everywhere. It's proposed in DeFi, C5, perhaps elsewhere as well. And so C5 uh, says that we can easily remove the LP just like D5 can do. But then instead of, uh, you know, we have, to, we have to define what the prepare period looks like. And so the prepare period in this alternate low power mode uh, is just what I call a frozen wire state. You just hold the wire state uh, constant for a while. You're not transmitting. You're not doing anything. You're just holding, preparing the receiver. And then you start sending um, data. And so how does this translate into low power transmissions? In DSI, for example, uh, panel commands often are in low power mode. And camera sometimes is, is trending towards that as well. So a, a previous generation C5 or D5, low power transmissions had certain sequences. So you had the escape mode entry command first. And then you had an LP data transmission command that you needed to send and then the actual uh, payload bytes. So we said we're going to go to uh, the alternate low power uh, stop, stop state. The entire EME and LPDT can all go with this new technology from C5. And instead, it'll be replaced by the preparation period. Uh, but then the LPDT command, what was orange in the previous slide, is now a sequence of symbols in HS. And then the uh, the actual data being transmitted is also a sequence of symbols. And the key point here, the punchline really, is that these LP data commands or uh, LP data transmissions, they're all unmapped words. So again, this, this space of seven symbol sequences that are available to us are now being deployed to more easily create technologies like alternate low power state or, or other technologies. So you could see a system now where you could stay in HS forever and simply send these secondary communication uh, words or messages to change the modes of, uh, of the receiver. And that's really what the unmapped words do. We, uh, this table here is just a, a one of many uh, sets of tables in the specifications in 1.2 and beyond, where we use the unmapped words to create backwards compatibility with LP, but also to uh, move us forward and create secondary communication messages. Uh, another uh, feature of uh, the next gen C5 that is for advanced users perhaps is the uh, number of sync words. So I mentioned that sync is unmapped and there's actually a possibility to create several of them. So the one we've seen so far in the presentation is this number here that ends in three. 
that's the sync word, uh, but there's actually a, a series of them that are available and that could be used for enhanced scrambling capability and better noise immunity and so on. So here's now, you know, taking these, these new technologies, the unmapped words, the sync words, uh, we get into what uh, these can mean for CSI. So uh, this is a picture from MIPI Alliance. It's, it's MIPI Alliance's uh, data. It just shows that a typical camera link could be two trios, again, six wires, and uh, no clock associated with it. To enable applications like uh, self-driving cars or even uh, you know, VR headsets that require longer, longer cables, there is a trend in the CSI imaging world where they're talking about long reach transport efficiency. What, means, what this means is we want to limit the overhead of LP. We want to uh, maximize our usage of time and stay in HS as much as possible. And so we talked about the unmapped words and uh, how they actually allow us to delimit packets even if we stay in HS forever. So you could have an HS packet and use an unmapped word to say, you know, my packet has ended, I'm going to start another packet, and so on, without ever having to, go to uh, leave uh, HS and go into LP. So that's a very powerful tool, and the key is that it's very robust digitally. There is no ambiguity with these unmapped words. Uh, alternate low power state was mentioned, and it's, uh, you know, it's available in D5, it's available in C5 as well, no difference. And then, of course, the number of virtual channels is increased uh, dramatically. The uh, multiple sync words are used primarily to enhance the robustness of scrambling technology in C5. It's an advanced topic. I just thought of bringing it up, but uh, we can read about it in the, um, in the specification. And then finally, for uh, DSI, DSI already deploys multiple packets within a burst. It does that in D5, and it did it in C5 before. And we're only showing again that the, uh, the seven symbol sequences really eliminate any ambiguity between packets. And, and that's one of the challenges in creating robust DSI transmissions uh, in the past. In C5, that's addressed uh, quite efficiently. And then, of course, just like D5, we've heard it at the plenary, we've heard it at the keynotes. C5 does support display stream compression. It's the trend. It allows for, uh, you know, deeper... Uh, colors, you know, higher number of bits per uh, pixel without necessarily creating any visual loss on the, on the images. And of course, panels, CK showed some examples of panels lighting up. And so lighting up a panel is not just a matter of sending frame data. You actually have to have some level of handshake with the display driver IC. And that's enabled in C5 just like it is in, uh, in D5. So this uh, concludes the presentation. We went through a very basic introduction to what C5 is. Mentioned that it's you know, a three-phase encoded technology. It's, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a well-understood well technology. And the key is that it allows us to achieve high bandwidth in constrained channels. So if, you're, if your system is using chip on glass or chip on flex or something that's just very hard to manage physically, then C5 is probably the technology for you. Uh, we introduced the concept of unmapped words and how they can create really a very sophisticated messaging scheme, uh, almost sideband mes messaging scheme uh, on a link. And then we introduced how these technologies could enable C uh, CSI and DSI uh, systems. Thank you, Dr. Hyper.